the biggest titles from Valve Software and Riot Games look oddly similar to each other. Is this a case of blatant copying or just similar ideas? To understand, we have to go all the way to the beginning. On March 31st, 1998, Blizzard Entertainment released a real-time strategy game called StarCraft. It went on to be a huge hit and would forever change the gaming space, but possibly the biggest contribution wasn't even their own. StarCraft contained a custom mapping tool, so players could create new game modes with their own rules. This led to the birth of several genres, but no map was as influential as Iron of Strife. It featured a design with three lanes, eight playable heroes and the objective to destroy enemy structures. The map was liked by the community, but no one at the time realized its potential, so it remained just that, another map. Four years later, Blizzard released the third installment in the Warcraft series. World of Warcraft 3 also featured a map maker and a modder by the name of EUL got inspired by Iron of Strife to create a new one called Defense of the Ancients or Dota for short. After the release of a new Warcraft expansion, which added new features to the map editor, EUL did not update his creation, which encouraged others to make their own iterations. The most famous one of the bunch was Dota All-Stars, developed by Steve Fig, also known as Ginzo. Dota All-Stars was the most fun iteration of the idea and it quickly gained popularity amongst the community. Despite its success, Ginzo stepped away from development in 2006 to play World of Warcraft, but unbeknownst to him, this was only the beginning. The next notable developer for Dota All-Stars was Icefrog, who took the game in a completely different direction. While Ginzo was focused more on making the game fun, the new developer took it upon himself to balance the game out, allowing for a competitive setting which was even played at BlizzCon. A more competitive focused approach seemed to fit the game much better. Luckily, the now inactive Ginzo's talents didn't go unnoticed. The same year he stopped working on Dota, two college roommates saw the opportunity in the gaming space and funded the company Riot Games. Their whole philosophy was a disagreement with major developers and their focus on too many games at the time, claiming that Dota is an indication that even video games could be supported and monetized on a long term. Them being ahead of their time is also proven by deciding to make a free-to-play title based on in-game purchases. They wanted to make their own standalone version of the Warcraft map and deemed Ginzo to be the perfect plan to assist them. After three years of development, League of Legends released on October 27th, 2009 to a massively positive reception. Those early days when Ginzo had the most influence are now considered the game's best. Just like in Dota All-Stars, his priority was fun over a balanced out game, which made for an especially entertaining experience. This attitude grew a loving community that gave developers headaches later on when they decided to push the game in a more competitive direction. But that is exactly what kept the game as big as it is, even though it doesn't have the cultural influence it used to. Such success obviously did not go unnoticed, and since Dota wasn't trademarked, Valve took up the opportunity. In 2009, they hired Icefrog, who was still working on Dota All-Stars. After four years of maintaining the old version and working on the sequel, Dota 2 was released to a dedicated audience that is willing to play a slightly more difficult game. At a quick glance, the games are very similar, but the more you look into it, the more they differ. Their white champion pools fulfill different roles, with League having a more limiting design. Champions are picked correspondingly to their roles, while Dota's pick system is based a lot more on countering the opponent. Furthermore, Riot is developing their champions much more dependent on skill shots compared to their counterpart. League's champions rely a lot on hitting skill abilities and fulfilling their role in the game, while Dota's heroes are more complex, with their purpose being catered more towards controlling the map and being self-sufficient. Dota 2 also makes it easier to snowball your lead as others have a difficult time catching up. It's not unusual for one person to carry the game, while no matter how much you gap your lane opponent in League of Legends, there is always a decent chance that the enemy team makes up for it. But easier to carry doesn't mean less difficult gameplay. 
it's quite the opposite as there is a stronger emphasis on gold management with a more complex item system that allows for greater customization. Deciding the superior game mainly comes down to one's personal preference, but there is one category in which there is a clear winner. For League's 10th anniversary, a show based in the game's universe was announced to be in production. Two years later, before Arcane could even be released, a different show called Dota Dragon's Blood was going to be released on Netflix. With such names behind them, could the series of bad video game adaptations finally be ended? Dragon's Blood was good. It satisfied both fans of the game and newcomers with its tense fight scenes and the fantastic narrative. Even if it's loved by fans, the show didn't generate much buzz and mostly flew under the radar. Eight months later, it was Arcane's turn to try to be better than its predecessors. It blew everyone's expectations with their soundtrack, incredible animation, great story and lovable characters. The show is easily one of the best video game adaptations and it just cemented League's wider cultural appeal. Arcane finally broke the tradition of underwhelming video game media. Almost every creative work takes inspiration from something made before it. Video games are no exception, but that means they often copy from other titles, especially in a new genre where there is little to go off of. So when it comes to their MOBAs, Valve and Riot took from the same source rather than copied each other. Their communities grew up from arguing and fighting and don't mind each other meaning that the games are able to coexist in the industry. This point is also proven by both of them hosting some of the biggest prize tournaments. League and Dota follow the same principle, but the gameplay differs quite a lot, which also applies to the company's other two biggest titles. Just like most Valve games, Counter-Strike started off as a mod but later became a successful franchise. The first official release of a standalone title came in 2000. It has since gone through many iterations, the most famous one being Global Offensive, which is currently the biggest Valve game. Counter-Strike put a unique spin to the first-person shooter genre with its hard to master and full of trick source engine that combined with unique gameplay encouraged players to take the time to learn it. The amount of fun and skill expression that was offered quickly won over many fans. The game's popularity, combined with the lucrative skin system, made others interested in making their own shooter. Many have tried, but no one could create a serious competitor until Rao decided to give it a spin. Unlike others, they took the time to perfect the mechanic and created an experience that rivals the one of Counter-Strike. Project A went into development in 2014, but beta access didn't become available until 2020. However, that's exactly when Riot shined. They gave out beta access as a Twitch drop which heavily boosted the game's viewership and consequently the hype surrounding it. Another thing that worked in their favor was Covid and in the summer Valorant was the new release everyone was looking to play. It was clear that the game was coming out swinging but was it enough to overtake the giant that is Counter Strike. It's obvious from the first glance that developers tried to mimic CSGO, with Riot going as far as hiring former Valve employees. While it was rumored to be the CS killer, Valorant was always headed in a different direction. The game's whole objective was being widely available, easy to run and get into, but still hard to truly master. It was meant mainly as an easily accessible tactical shooter, which also represents the majority of their audience who are not as experienced and are there to mainly have a good time. Despite that, the professionals seem to cough. With Counter-Strike being an eSport powerhouse, it was obvious from the start that Valorant was going to make numbers, even if the game wasn't as purely competitive. Due to its more beginner-friendly design, it falls short of the incredibly precise gameplay, where you have to be frame-perfect to be at the top. CSGO also prevailed due to the Source engine and its infamous movement mechanics. It adds a whole new layer of depth and separates the men from the boys. Even if not comparable, Router did confiscate by adding skill movement with certain abilities. Abilities are the main difference between Counter-Strike and Valorant. Global Offensive is a slower-paced game with utility enhancing this aspect. 
its bland colors and only being really engaging for a few moments in a round create a serious gameplay. Combined with the requirement to train spray patterns, smoke lineups and pre-fires makes it feel a lot more like a sport. Valorant's abilities would better be compared with Overwatch than CSGO, as they drastically change the gameplay. It's closer to an ability-based game with a shooter aspect. The saturated colors, constant overstimulating action, new map and agent additions make for a game trying to appeal to as many people as possible. Valorant burst onto the scene with a brand new approach and for the first time a competitor was presented that seemed to be way more engaging. Past and current CSGO pros started considering switching careers and with everyone at least trying Valorant out, Valve has threatened to be overtaken. Why play the same game you've been playing for 8 years and you could play this shiny new one with constant updates, new maps and heroes. At the time, CSGO was receiving less and less updates but then all of a sudden, Valve became concerned. They wouldn't really care, but it was hurting their profit, which is the only thing that gets to them. After Valorant's release, CSGO started making operations more frequently, added the retake mode, switched some apps and breathed new life into the game. It just goes to show what some healthy competition does, because otherwise, who knows how much new content Valve would make. Valorant did eventually slow down, as they seemed to be adding less and less maps and heroes. Counter-Strike was able to maintain their popularity, and with the announcement of Source 2, that seems to be only increasing. The games grew in their own directions, as CSGO is meant for more hardcore gamers and hobbyists, while Valorant is notorious for e-daters and people coming to hang out while playing. It again turned out to be a matter of personal preference, but once more, Riot had an advantage. Something that Valorant turned out to be better at is its anti-cheat. The program is a bit more invasive, but it works really well, especially if you compare it to Valve anti-cheat, aka you aren't allowed to open OBS when playing CSGO, but you are allowed this cool little b-hop script. Encountering cheaters in Valorant is rare, while it would be a weird day if you don't find any in CSGO, but compared to another Valve game, they still have it easy. Valorant also proved that Riot just can't get out of their own skin. They often make new content, but the fanbase is usually split on liking it. New maps being added are often not really liked and Icebox had to even be updated after community backlash. The bad balance of new heroes is something that is also clearly seen in League of Legends. They usually pack way more abilities to a new character, which makes a lot of the early ones obsolete. After a few weeks of the new champion being busted, they slowly nerfed it to the ground where it barely gets picked. It has become very frustrating at this point, as they clearly do it to boost the popularity on a release. CSGO on the other hand has way less frequent updates, the gameplay is quite balanced as it is and there aren't any heroes to complicate it. All cosmetic updates mainly include changes for guns, like a SG or an M4M1S buff, or changes to maps themselves. They often release a more significant update, like enabling grenade drops, but even those don't shake up the gameplay too much. Despite their weird updates, Rao chants best at interacting with the community. They often share news and updates, either individually or as a team. Valve, on the other hand, isn't really known for being communicative or anyhow interacting with the fanbase. They're a privately owned company, so they don't have to listen to anyone except Gaben, who doesn't really give a shit. But there are still other ways of fans sticking with your game, and Valve have mastered the art of community interactions without them having to do any of the work themselves. The community market and the entire cosmetic system in general is far superior to Valorant. Even if Riot's designs are more unique and engaging, they simply cannot compete with CSGO. Their skins are an entire subgenre of the game, with an arguably even more dedicated fanbase. Valve furthermore contributed to the community engagement with adding community-made skin designs in cases and an entire server browser for fan-made games. Both sides have advantages and disadvantages, so when it comes to their games, play whatever suits you best, it's purely opinion-based. If you don't like it, take your ass back to Valorant, motherfucker. Do you think we give a single fuck about Riot Games? Fucking Chinese cucks that ship games with spyware? In terms of maintaining your fanbase, there are lots of more ways, 
but despite that, many managed to fail and run their company into the ground. 